um, real happy to reach the conclusion of the 2021 draft. Uh, we just met with all the scouts and coaches and congratulate them on their efforts. And, you know, our, our bottom line is we think we're a better team today than we were yesterday. And that's, that's always the goal coming out of coming out of this process. You know, we've talked about Najee and Pat and Kendrick Green before um, yesterday. I know the assistant coaches uh, addressed those guys that we didn't talk about, and we'll be glad to answer any questions along those lines. Um, but, you know, Pat and Kendrick, both, you know, quality players, um, both have versatility. Pat can play in, in the formation, outside the formation. Kendrick has played both center and guard, and he'll start off as a center here. Today, we added Dan Moore. Dan's been a three-year starter down at Texas A&M, playing in the SEC at left tackle, and did a nice job there. Buddy Johnson, his teammate, you know, Buddy was the was a team captain, but he was also the leader of that group. And that group had several very good players on it, as witnessed by their the draft picks today. And Buddy was a big part of it. Buddy's a, a good run defender that shows up in coverage, and he'll be able to help out on special teams. We traded our fourth round pick in 2022 um, to be able to draft Isaiah Loudermilk this year. And then in doing that, just to address the trade part of it, uh, we're pretty sure that we'll have a, some type of compensatory pick in that fourth round range. We never know exactly what that will be, uh, but we feel confident. And we just wanted to get back into that fifth round this year, especially when a guy like Isaiah was available. You know, a lot of milk played in 3-4 defense. He's got the length and the athleticism that you like. He's played techniques that he'll continue to be taught here. So that was real um, exciting to be able to trade back into that round and uh, get a guy like Isaiah. Quincy Roche did a nice job trans after he, tra he grad transferred from Temple uh, down to the University of Miami at Temple. His junior or his junior year, he was a um, I believe it was 13 sacks and he played exclusively defensive end for Miami, but he has the athleticism to definitely project to the outside backer spot. Trey Norwood is a safety slash corner. He's played both at Oklahoma. You know, he was moved to safety and before he was injured uh, last season in 2019, he came back, put together five interceptions uh, for Oklahoma this season, playing mainly safety, but he also is a package guy that can move around and coach will address that. And then Presley Harvin, Presley Harvin is a big legged guy. I mean, he, when I say that he has a naturally powerful leg, um, he averaged 44, seven for his career. I believe it was 47, six this season. And it's just a natural, powerful leg. And again, excited to have him come in and join the competition. Uh, we're in the process of starting to sign free agents. Hopefully um, we get that process wrapped up here quick and then we'll be ready to move on. Coach? Uh, nothing to add. I'll be happy to address any questions you guys might have. Kevin did an awesome job of summarizing kind of what we've done today and, and this weekend to, to get to this point. Jerry Dulac? Hey, uh, uh, Coach and, and uh, Kevin, uh, for both of you, was, is it just coincidence or did you make uh, a concentrated effort? You took a lot of seniors guys with uh, multiple year, uh, multiple starts over their career. Uh, does that, was that any part of the focus? I don't know that senior was a direct focus. I know we, we really were interested in guys that had an opportunity to play in 2020. Um, you know, di no disrespect to those who didn't play in 2020 or who participated in conferences who had uncertainty in that area. We just had a certain level of comfort with people with fluid resumes and, and participation in 2020. And when it was close, as Kevin had mentioned on several occasions leading up to this weekend, uh, we were gonna lean uh, toward those who, who played in 2020. Bill Rudder. It just happened to work out that you were gonna use the first four on offense, then follow it up with the next four on defense. Yeah, again, just to echo Coach's comments about the seniors, there was really no plan for that entering into this draft. That's just the way it unfolded for us. 
Uh, happy to have some balance. I don't even know what the exact numbers were. Uh, it looks like it was 441. So we, we included the special teams for the tiebreaker, but it was no intent to do that. And, you know, have hopefully, uh, again, we got balanced help for both sides of the football or all three sides of the football. Mark Amoli. Hey, Kevin, uh, it seemed like you played the draft board quite well uh, by getting the skill positions early where that might not have been as deep then getting value with Green and Moore later where those positions weren't uh, were deeper. Is that fair to say? And it, and it seems like you, uh, you balance need with want with those first four. Is that fair to say as well? Well, I think when we look at the board, uh, we look at who's available, uh, regardless of the depth. If we really like that player, um, we're going to take them there. If we know there is good depth and there's at two positions and two players are graded pretty close, uh, we will take the player that has the most or the least amount of depth um, as we look at the, the total picture. So in, in that case, I, like I might, what I mean to say is if we like a guy, regardless of the depth, we'll take him. But if it's close and there's more depth, we'll probably take the position with the least depth. Brooke Breyer. Yeah, Kevin and, and Coach, when talking with Adrian Clem last night, he mentioned kind of an emphasis on drafting these offensive linemen that have a nasty streak to them. And it kind of seems like talking with the guys across the board who were drafted, that they all have this toughness, this inherent nastiness. How important was it to bring guys like that into the fold, especially when you're doing things like remaking the offensive line? Yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, that play demeanor that you mentioned is something that we always covet, at least, you know, the time period that I've been here. I just think it's a component of football uh, that's time tested and, um, you know, supersedes all tr uh, trends and things of that nature. So I don't know if that was a new dis new discussion or a new discovery for us. Will Graves? Mike, uh, on Monday, you made it a point to mention that fixing the running game isn't just exclusively based on, you know, bringing in new faces. That being said, you also, I mean, if you look at the first four guys and in general, those guys are designed to maybe help you better in that area. I mean, what do you like about that group at all in general? And, and do you think your running game is better maybe now than it was three days ago? You know, I, I like the players. I like their talents. I like what they were able to do at their universities. Uh, as I mentioned on Monday, uh, the acquisition of players is just a component of it. Uh, obviously, I feel better about where we are um, today than I did on Monday because those are four quality players. But as I mentioned on Monday, it's just a component. <clears throat> We're excited about teaching them. We're excited about training. We're excited about the evolution of our schematics. And all of those things are gonna, is going to ultimately determine uh, the look of it all. Jeff Hathorne. Mike, what's the value of having a guy the size of louder milk that can play up, you know, at, at any point along the line? What what does that bring for you guys? You know, there's there's a scarcity when you talk about the size of louder milk. And and that was one of the things that was really intriguing to us. Um, also intriguing to us is that he's got a lot of experience in a very similar scheme defensively. So it wasn't a lot of guesswork, uh, much like when we were looking at Watt. Uh, when he came out of Wisconsin, it was an easy evaluation because all the things that he did at Wisconsin, whether it was play anywhere from a five to, to the interior parts of their formation structure, we'll be asking them to do similar things. Chris Carter. Hey guys, I know Kevin said that, you know, you guys weren't overly focused on, you know, one position or one type of thing, but you guys did draft a lot of guys that are going to be involved in the trenches, either running the ball or blocking the runners or trying to stop the runners. And it seemed like that was kind of an emphasis here. You know, you guys are in a division where there's a lot of good running talent. What, how do you guys think that you guys are going to fare with that, with the guys that you've added now with that? Well, you know, hopefully these guys will, will make us a better team. As we mentioned, when we opened up, uh, we think we'll be better, um, just as Coach alluded to. Um, you know, the new work will start on Monday, um, not with this group because they can't come in quite yet. But, you know, we hope we've, we've added people on both sides, uh, interior, offensive, and defensive linemen. And we really added people at every level um, at positions that we really wanted to add to. So, again, we'll wait and see how much they can do for us. A couple more. 
Mike, you mentioned that excitement that you had about these guys. What excites you about this draft class as a whole and what they're going to bring to this team? You know, I can't, I can't think of a last day of a draft where I haven't been excited. You know, uh, new men to work with is exciting. Um, getting to know these guys over the course of the last several months through our research uh, brings a certain level of anticipation. Uh, we're excited about getting started with them. Uh, there are a lot of reasons to be excited. Uh, but if you're in this business, particularly from a coach's standpoint, uh, players of the lifeblood, uh, new quality, talented young men to work with, uh, makes you smile. Alan Saunders? Yeah, it was uh, a lot of Big Ten and SEC guys early, and then I think you stuck with the power conference guys all the way. I know you've, you've uh, been open about liking some of the MAC talent you had, but they played a really short schedule. How much did that play into things when you were looking at it and trying to evaluate these guys? Yeah, you know, during the process, we did mention that the um, there wasn't as many MAC players that were on our board this year. Not to say that there, there wasn't good players in the MAC. There just wasn't as many as there have been in recent years. Their shortened season, I'm sure, didn't help along those lines. But the MAC has always produced uh, good NFL players. This year was just a little bit less numbers than usual. No extracting. Hey guys, a lot of your players have experience or your rookies have experience at multiple positions. Was versatility an emphasis when you looked at who was left on the board? Yeah, we always look for that, that versatility uh, because we have to figure out what they can do. And if they have different options and, and talents, then, you know, I know coaches are always excited about um, bringing a guy in and, and finding out about them. And um, it, it's really, you know, We'll learn about these players as we go on, but when you have different options for them, I know it's exciting for coach and I'll let coach address that too. Yeah, versatility helps them uh, and it helps us. And, and by that, I mean, uh, when you're a young guy trying to carve out a niche for yourself, versatility aids you in doing so. And it also aids us in terms of making decisions and finding work for them. So versatility is an asset that, that we're really excited about. Um, it, it helps all parties involved. All right, final one before they have to go up for free agents. Uh, Tim Benz. Kevin, uh, you were real patient waiting for defensive back and outside linebacker help, even though you had some outs, um, uh, free agent departures this offseason. Is that just a result of how the board broke or depth at those positions of the draft, your own depth on your roster? What, what played in the factors there? Really everything, uh, because we knew there was certain amounts of depth at all the all the different positions, and we just had to wait it out. Um, again, trading back in to the, the fifth round with a future pick, um, we didn't want to let a, a defensive player like Isaiah Loudermilk out there. So to be able to trap, you know, to be able to draft that young man at that spot, I think it was just indicative of the people that we felt were available in Isaiah's case, there wasn't a lot of defensive linemen entering into this draft. And, uh, you know, obviously they started to get picked and that's why we were willing to trade a pick from next year, because we were pretty sure we'll have some type of compensatory pick. That wasn't the one we traded. We traded our actual pick, but that'll be supplanted, supplanted by uh, a compensatory pick in some form. Okay. Thank you, Mike and Kevin. As for the media, that wraps it up for uh our availabilities for the draft. We'll let you know for rookie mini camp and OTAs in the next couple of weeks. So thank you guys. Thank you. Appreciate it.